everybody, welcome to Cornerstone Church. What an honor it is to lift up the name of Jesus with you all. So why don't you join me and clap your hands like this, come on. Come on. Hey, we have this confidence. We have this confidence in Jesus. Come on. His blood has brought us into freedom. There is no other that can save us. Cause we know, yes we know, it's Jesus. Come on, see it now. He is always with us.
and the freedom to stand in your presence this morning and worship you. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. In your holy name we pray, amen. Cornerstone, how we doing? I am so pumped that we get to worship together this morning and hear the word together. If you are brand new in this place today, a special welcome to you. We want to get to know you. The easiest way to do that is to text 
new to 21999. And if you are in the building today, make sure you stop by the New Here Start Here booth on your way out. We have a gift that we would love to give you. And for those of you that are in the room, you've been checking us out for a few weeks now. You've decided, hey, I want to stick around. I'm in it to win it, but I just want to know a little bit more about who Cornerstone is and how I fit. We have our Next Steps class coming up. It's a four-week experience where we dive deeper into our heart and vision as a church and how God has created you to worship and to grow in your relationship with him and to serve your church, your community, and the world around you. So if that's you today and you want to start that next part of your journey, we would love to come alongside you and partner with you. Text NEXT to 21999 to register for Next Steps today. You guys, I can't believe I'm already saying this, but in just a few weeks, Easter is coming. It's coming in hot. We get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who's excited? I better hear the loudest applause ever on that one because that's why we're here. That's why we're here today, because he rose, because the tomb is empty. And March 29th through the 31st, we have 12 identical Easter experiences for you to participate in. We would love if you would celebrate with us this year. Bring a friend, bring a coworker, bring a family member that you've been praying for, that you've been witnessing to. This is your opportunity. We are going to have an amazing message. We are going to have an immersive worship experience. We're going to have Easter hunts, egg hunts every hour. All kinds of fun stuff is going to be happening and we can't wait to celebrate with you. Would you do me a favor though and text Easter to 21999 and let us know what service you are planning on coming to. We can't wait. And I just have to say, I say it every time that I'm up here, thank you guys so much for your continual generosity. It is because of you that we can keep propelling the gospel forward and doing what God has called us to do as a church for such a time as this. So thank you so much. And if there's any of you in the room that you wanna start being a part of our weekly giving, you can do so today by texting GIVE to 21999. Thank you guys so much. Check this out. Well, good morning, Cornerstone. How are we doing? Man, I'm not going to lie. After watching that bumper video, I'm about to like say that I'm a woman and come listen to Megan Fate Marshman preach in this place. Like That lady's incredible. So um, all you ladies should definitely be at that thing. So, hey, if I have not had the chance to meet you, which I would assume is most of you in this room, um, my name is Daniel. I came here this morning all the way from the wonderful city of Queen Tucky, Arizona. Um, I live in Queen Creek. Uh, I work at a church called Rock Point, and our churches are very connected. If you didn't know that, our senior pastor was actually in your senior pastor's youth group way back in the day. And so our churches are connected. We love this place. I'm honored to get to be here with you. I believe that God has given me something that we need to hear this morning. And so if you brought a Bible, which I hope you did, open them up to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to jump right into the middle of a kind of bizarre little story, but I believe that God's going to use it to speak to us this morning. So Numbers 11, you turn there. I'll pray for us and we will jump in. Father, 
God, we are so thankful to gather in your house today. God, we come with hearts full of expectation because we know that being in your presence, it will change us. And so Holy Spirit, right now, would you do what you do? Speak through one person, but speak specifically and individually to every single person that's in this room this morning. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, all God's people said. Amen. So to kind of set where I want to go, I was thinking about this story that happened when I was a kid. I don't know, I was 11 or 12, and hopefully this has happened to you too, and I'm not the only horrible human in the room, but who knows, we'll see, maybe it's just me. Um, so it was, I don't know, Christmas morning coming around when I was like 11 or 12 years old, and I guess for context, for those of you who are young in this room, you'll have to ask your parents after service what I mean by it, but we used to do this thing when I was a kid called playing outside. Um, and it's a wild concept today, but the cul-de-sac is like, man, that's like where it went down. You know, like that's where we lived. If you were not at school, like you were in the cul-de-sac. And then when the lights went off, you went home. And, but the cul-de-sac is where everything happened. And so we would play everything out there. And at, at the time at school, what started to become like the sport was basketball. But I wasn't very good. And so I told my parents, hey, we need to get a basketball hoop out on the cul-de-sac so I can practice out there, go to school, and ball up my friends and impress everybody, right? And so for Christmas, I told them, like, I need a basketball hoop. And so my my parents were usually pretty good at, you know, getting you the gifts that you wanted. And funny enough, they were actually at this service last night because they're, they're in town visiting. And so I was able to remember how terrible they were to me that Christmas last night. But uh, Christmas morning happens and, you know, I'm like, look, if it's you or Magic Santa, like whoever it is, like, I, I don't really care. I just need a basketball hoop, right? And so I come walking down the stairs for Christmas morning and I look and none of the boxes are big enough. And so I'm sitting there like, you know, my parents are so awesome. They probably got like a magic one that uh, it's going to be in a small box, but then it'll get bigger and they're going to like do something to impress me, right? Well, we open up all the gifts and with five kids in the household, like Christmas morning is just trying to avoid all the shrapnel that's being thrown around as gifts are opened and we get through all the gift opening, no basketball hoop. So I look at my parents and do the logical thing and just kind of throw a temper tantrum, right, like a good 11-year-old would do. And then my parents let me kind of, you know, hem and haw for a few minutes. And then my dad was like, hey, do you want to follow me out to the garage real quick? We go out to the garage and would you believe it, there was a basketball hoop that was set up out in the garage and that's why I feel like I'm a terrible person and I probably won't get invited back after I share that story with you. But hey, we're here now. Here's the reason that I tell you the story. Maybe you've had it or your kids have done it to you. I try, my kids have done similar things, but I try not to air their dirty laundry in church. But um, here's the funny part. As I think back to that moment, I had convinced myself for whatever reason, how juvenile as it was, it was my reality in that season that this is what I really needed to be fulfilled, to really have like these deeper longings in my heart met. Like I just needed a basketball hoop. And it was amazing to me as I look back in those few moments where I, I was convinced I didn't have that thing. All of a sudden, I, I became completely oblivious. I was blinded to all the blessings that were happening right in front of me. And the fact that I had just opened Christmas presents was completely lost on me. Forget the Christmas presents for a second. The reality that I was living in a house that my dad paid for that I didn't even pay rent in. I was eating his food, living in his clothes, but because I was so fixated on what I didn't have, I became blind to the provision that my father had for me. Friends, the reason I start there is I believe that it's not just you and I on Christmas mornings that will be tempted to miss what God is doing in our life. But I believe that sitting here today right now that some of us could be blind to the things that God is doing, the amazing blessings that God has in our life that should be all around us. Sometimes we won't see them because we will allow this thing called envy and jealousy in comparison to set into our heart. And when it's there, I promise you, it will begin to blind you to all of the amazing things that God is doing in your life. I want to spend the next few moments tell, trying to convince you, friends, that I believe that envy, if left in us, it will begin to blind us to how good our God has been to us. The story in Numbers chapter 11 is kind of a bizarre story. It finds the people of uh, God, the nation of Israel, okay? The majority of the Old Testament records the story of the Israelites. And it was a nation that God chose in spite of who they were. It wasn't because of their pedigree. It wasn't because of how awesome they were. God chose them in spite of them. And he used them to show the world what his relationship with his people would look like. Well, the Israelites at some point, they found themselves facing a massive famine in the land. And so they would go to Egypt to find refuge. And the Pharaoh at the time had favor for God's people. And so he allowed them to live there and they prospered and they thrived. And eventually the nation of Israel would grow to over 2 million people. Well, the Pharaoh that liked them passed away. A new Pharaoh comes on the scene and this Pharaoh wakes up and realizes, wait, there's a group of 2 million people that live amongst us. 
that don't vote like us, that don't believe like us, that don't look like us. This isn't a good thing. And so he made a logical decision to enslave those people. And God's people found themselves in captivity in something that really wasn't even their fault. And so the nation of Israel began to pray to God to deliver them out of slavery. And God would rise up a deliverer and a man named Moses. Moses would go to Pharaoh. He would famously take his staff, throw it on the ground. It would become a snake. He would bring the locusts and the frogs. He would turn the Nile River into blood, showing Pharaoh who God was. And eventually Pharaoh would say, okay, you can take the people. They can begin to leave and go into freedom. And famously, he has to part the Red Sea and God's people walk through it. And the first 10 chapters of the book of Number records the nation of Israel's story on the other side of the Red Sea. It's a year where the people of God are being taught what it means to operate and live as free people. Because here's the thing that God knew about them that I believe is also true about us. is friends, the, the bondage of addiction, the bondage of sin can be broken in a second. The chains can fall off in a moment. But the patterns, the unhealthy rhythms, the rituals and routines that we picked up in our season of slavery, it takes a while to unlearn some of those things. And for a year, God with his people, Numbers 1 through 10, is God teaching them what it means to be a free person, how to worship him in the temple, how to have order amongst them, for him to be their God and to be their provider. But he's told them from the very beginning of this journey, friends, you are going to Canaan. I'm taking you to a place called the promised land, a place that flows with milk and honey, which just sounds delicious, right? He says, that's where you're going. And in Numbers chapter 11, they're now ordered, they are structured, they've begun to realize who God is, and they're going to make their way to the promised land. The march is beginning. Okay, that is the context that sets up where we are in Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. It says, soon the people began to complain about their hardship, and the Lord heard everything they said. Very first verse, and the people of God are already complaining again, already frustrated in the season that they're in. And then the Lord's anger blazed against them, and he set a fire to rage among them, and he destroyed some of the people in the outskirts of the camp. Like, this is one of the most gangster verses in the Bible. God's like, you want to complain? I'm going to light a couple of you on fire, and then I'm going to come back and see, you still have something to complain about? I'm like, God, can I borrow this trick with my kids? Like, I'm not going to light them all on fire, but just one and be like, somebody else want to complain? Like, I need this in my tool bag, right? I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. Verse 2 says, then, then the people screamed to Moses for help. And when he prayed to the Lord, the fire stopped. And after that, the area was known as Tabra, which is Hebrew for barbecue. I'm just kidding. It's not. Okay. It's insensitive. It means the place of burning because the fire from the Lord had burned among them there. Verse four, then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to, don't miss this. They began to crave the good things of Egypt, the place where they were slaves, the place where they were literally in chains. They began to misremember how bad Egypt was and the people of Israel also began to complain, oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. I'm not gonna lie, I had Caldwell's with my family for lunch yesterday. I understand what they're talking about here. If you had to go years without barbecue, I'd be like, God, I believe that you're good, but we need some barbecue up in this place. Amen. Verse five, they say, we remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. We had all the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and garlic that we could have ever wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. The manna looked like small coriander seeds and it was pale yellow like gum resin. The people would go out and gather it from the ground. They made flour by grinding it with the hand mills or pounding it in mortars. Then they boiled it in a pot and made it into flat cakes. These cakes tasted like pastries baked with olive oil. The manna came down on the camp with the dew during the night. Verse 10, last verse. Moses heard all the family standing in the doorway of their tents whining. And the Lord became extremely angry. Moses was also incredibly aggravated. Here's what's happening. The nation of Israel, now a year into freedom, they're starting to realize that maybe this freedom isn't going to feel how they thought it was going to feel. It doesn't look how they thought it was going to look. 
Because here's what God was doing. The story just told us every morning they would walk out and there would be manna falling from the sky. God was literally supernaturally dropping bread from the heaven for them to pick up. And what God had explicitly told them to do was to only gather enough that they needed for today. And if they did what you and I probably would have done if we were there as well, if they gathered more than a day's worth, they would wake up in the morning and the extra would have spoiled or gone bad. Because what God was trying to teach them is that I'm your provider. I'm your provision. I am your daily bread. But the problem was is they didn't really trust God to be their daily bread. They wanted to store up their stuff and trust in themselves. And God for a year was teaching them, no, 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 no. I'm your provider. You can trust me. I am a good father in heaven that will meet your every need. But friends, this is the danger that the nation of Israel was doing that you and I will often do as well. They were mistaking them hearing God will meet their every need with hearing that God's gonna give them everything that they could ever want. And this is the danger, friends, is you and I will mistake our wants for needs. And when we don't get what we feel like we deserve, when we don't get the basketball hoop on Christmas morning, we will wake up and we will begin to shake our fists at God. We will begin to ask the question, are you even there? God, where are you? When what God is trying to do in this season for the nation of Israel, that he will use our seasons of desert wanderings for us as well, he's using them to teach us. This whole season, Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 8, as he talks about the leadership principles that can be found in the season that's recorded in the book of Numbers, Moses tells us what God was doing is he was teaching them some things. And friends, this is what God uses our difficult seasons for, to teach us how to trust in him even when it doesn't make sense, how to believe that there's going to be food tomorrow even when we eat the last piece of bread before we go to bed. Believing that I don't know how, I don't know who, I don't know when, but somehow because God is in heaven and he is my father that provides good gifts, there will be food for me tomorrow. But here's what I believe the enemy is slowly doing to you and I living in the world that we live in today. I think what the enemy is doing is he's allowing us to settle into being envious, allowing this, this thing that seems really innocent to settle into our heart. But I think this story proves to us that envy is a much bigger deal to God than we realize. Because envy is something that, that begins to attach itself to every other sin. Here's the thing that I think we have to look at in the context in which we live in. Okay, We live in a world where comparison has never been as high as it is today. I think if you really break down, okay, what leads to envy? I think the thing that fuels envy is comparison. And I would argue in the context in the world that we live in, comparison has never been as high as it is today. Why? Because we see everything that all of us does every day, even when we don't want to, right? Social media has brought our world. We have access to people in ways that we never have before. And here's the three things, if you're taking notes, that I think we have to watch out for, that the enemy's going to do to get us to settle into allowing envy to be there. The first category that we have to watch out for is material comparison. It's amazing to me how you can get something that you've so desperately prayed for, like the nation of Israel, wanting to be free. But now that they're there, they're not experiencing what they thought was going to be on the other side of that blessing. I remember when I bought a car. I bought a truck that I would have said was like my dream truck. I wanted an F-150. I finally found it. I did the research. I got the truck that I wanted. And I'm like, man, this thing is amazing. And I loved it for about two days. And then a friend of mine got an F-250 and he posted it on Instagram. And I was like, what? I didn't even know I needed an extra 100. But now I want another 100. I don't want my f 150s terrible. I need an F-250, right? And all of a sudden, it was just a truck. People are like, oh, it's a cool truck. I'm like, yeah, it's just a truck. It's not an F-250. I remember my wife and I started to redo our, our house a little bit. We were doing our master bathroom. And I, again, I would have said this is like our dream bathroom. And then some friends of ours were redoing their bathroom. And they live in this place where now Queen Creek is like, I think they call it uh, Queen Hills or like it's, it's becoming Beverly Hills out there. You know what I mean? Like it's not the sticks anymore. If you haven't been out there, you got to come check it out. They start redoing their bathroom. And I'm like, what? They have a chandelier in their bathroom? Like my whole house can fit in their bathroom. And all of a sudden my dream bathroom, I was looking, I'm like, well, I guess we'll go to the bathroom in here, but that's about as good as this thing's ever going to be, right? Like it's... And what was a blessing compared to somebody else's all of a sudden became just a bathroom. 
And here's where we have to be careful. Friends, there's a reason that the generations coming up behind us are, are facing rates of depression and anxiety that we've never seen before. Because social media comes with some unintended consequences. And you will be tempted to compare your season, your blessing, your gifts from God to somebody else's. And if you're not careful, you will begin to miss all that God is doing in your life. For some of you, it isn't material comparison you've got to watch out for. For some of you, it's relational. For some of you who've wanted to be married for a long time and you still are like, man, I'm just tired of being the bridesmaid at the wedding and I finally want to be a bride. If you're not careful, you will begin to start to say things in your mind like, man, I'm just such a better person than all my friends and it seems like they're getting married and I'm not. God, where are you? God, have you just forgotten me? If you're in a season where you're newly married and trying to have babies and infertility just seems to be there and you don't know why, what will happen unintentionally if you begin to look at other people and you start to look at their lives, you will be tempted to go, dude, we eat nothing but bark and dirt and organic food. They eat McDonald's. They're having kids all day and we can't do anything. And what will happen is, is what God is trying to teach you in this season will be missed because your only prayer will be, God, get me out of this season instead of God, teach me what you have for me in this season. For some of us, it's not material, it's not relational. For some of us, it's more just circumstantial, okay? You're comparing your life as a working mom to those who are stay-at-home moms. The stay-at-home moms are comparing their life to the working moms. In either way, the fruit at the end of it all is the same. It's frustration, it's bitterness, and it's complete blindness to the things of God. In verse 6 in there, when the nation of Israel said that our appetites are gone, it doesn't actually, it's not actually a good translation of the original language. Because when you look at this verse in Hebrew, it's not talking about a, a physical like hunger. It's talking more like a life force. A better translation would be like our souls are withering away. The, the nation of Israel has convinced themselves that they are dying. They are withering away because they don't have barbecue and garlic and all they have is this supernatural bread. And it's a lie. It's not true. God was sustaining them. But they had convinced themselves that they needed something else and it was beginning to destroy them from the inside out. Here's what Proverbs tells us, friends. This is why you and I have to pay attention this morning. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, but jealousy is like cancer in the bones. It will rot you from the inside out. It will make you incredibly bitter and you will begin to not see the hand of God that's all around you. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says this in James chapter 3. He says, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. He's saying, don't just try to pretend like this is a message for somebody else. That this is a message for you and I because in verse 15 it says, For jealousy and selfishness, they're not God's kind of wisdom. Such things, don't miss this, are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find the disorder and evil of every kind. Remember the Bible says it is not flesh and bones that we wage war with, but it's spirits and principalities. I believe that one of the greatest enemies, that the, one of the greatest tools that the enemy uses to begin to blind us to how amazing and how good God has been to us is to get us to settle into comparison. To get us to sit there and just compare what we've been given to somebody else's. And what James says, here's why it's so important. Here's why God reacts so strongly to it in Numbers chapter 11. is because envy, it is a root sin. It is a sin that leads to every other sin. Envy is what leads you to lying and cheating and stealing. You remember the Ten Commandments? The last one, the tenth one, is thou shall not covet. Martin Luther, the famous church reformer, he said that what God did with the tenth commandment is he summarized all ten of them. Here's how to fulfill all of the commandments. Do not be envious. Do not covet what other people have. Maybe, just maybe, the reason that we struggle with pornography, the reason we step out and have affairs, isn't just a pure physical lust problem. Maybe it's actually an envious jealousy problem. And what we will do is we will convince ourselves that if I just had a different spouse, if my wife, if my husband just treated me the way that their husband, their wife treats them, if they would just respect me and love me the way that they love them, then this whole marriage thing would work. But here's what's crazy to me. Do you know that second marriages, the divorce rate of second marriages is almost double that of first marriages? 
Do you know what's only worse than second marriage divorce rates? Third marriages, said the four people who've walked through it, right? Third marriages have an even higher divorce rate. Why? Because you will be tempted to believe that it's your spouse's fault. It is your spouse's problem. And there are moments where we have to get out of unhealthy relationships. But oftentimes what we do is we convince ourselves that another spouse would be different. But the problem is, is once we get the new spouse, the, the, the roses and butterflies season and period wears off. And then we're left with the same broken and flawed you that hasn't dealt with those same things. And eventually your same brokenness will show up in that relationship and we forget that what God's primary purpose in marriage is, is to have somebody that helps you see all of your weaknesses and your flaws so that you can push towards holiness, not so that you can have somebody that does something perfectly. Friends, we are all imperfect people married to imperfect people, but together we can fight for holiness. Here's what I want us to see, okay? I try to belabor the point a little bit to say, friends, this matters. I believe the enemy is ravaging our culture right now by getting us to just look on social media and compare what we have to everybody else's and it's not producing good things in us. It's producing bitterness and frustration and anger and we are missing what God is doing right in front of us. There's three things that I think happens in the book of Numbers that I, I want us to actually take a look at. Three ways that I want to tell you what the enemy's plan is for your life. Remember the Bible tells us that we have to know his schemes, we have to know what he's trying to do so that we can thwart his plans. Well, I believe that Numbers 11 shows us some of his game plan. It shows us what the enemy's going to try to do and the very first thing that the enemy's going to try to do to you and I is he's going to try to blind us to God's past goodness. He's going to try to get you to rewrite the narrative of all that God has brought you through. He's going to get you to do the same thing that the nation of Israel does in freedom. Start to misremember how bad Egypt really was. Start to forget how thick the, the bondage was inside of Egypt, how heavy the chains were of the burden of debt that we got out of, how unhealthy that relationship really was, how destructive that addiction really was. You will begin on the other side in your freedom when you allow envy to be in your heart for a while. You'll begin to look back on your life and you'll go, maybe it was just emotionalism. Maybe it was just coincidental. Maybe that wasn't God supernaturally delivering me out of that. And maybe it was just random. Here's what's amazing to me. The very first verse that we read in this story, Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, it says that soon the people began to complain about their hardship. They're complaining about hardship, living in the freedom that they begged God for. Forgetting the numerous miracles that it took to get them to freedom, they're now living in that freedom going... Man, this season is just so hard. It tells me, friends, you and I have spiritual amnesia. We misremember how bad things really were. And here's what's amazing to me about the people in Numbers chapter 11. They had access to God in a way that we don't. I would argue we have access to God with the Holy Spirit that maybe is more of an advantage. But what we struggle with that they never had to struggle with was asking the question, God, where are you? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Numbers that God was literally physically with them. It says like a cloud, he would guide them during the day. And at night, that cloud would turn into a pillar of fire. At any moment, the people could wake up, walk outside and go, look, where's God? He's right there. He's literally right there. Remember Moses goes up, he comes down shining like God's with us. He's protecting us. He's supernaturally providing for us. God had built a monument to his goodness in front of them that they couldn't see. Here's where I, I brought these boxes out and this is like a little illustration. Even if it doesn't work, just tell me after service that you thought it was awesome because I'm, I'm pretty insecure. You laugh, but us people who get on stages are the most insecure people you've ever been around. I promise you, just kidding, mostly. What God had done to the people in Numbers chapter 11 is he had built a tower to his faithfulness. He was literally physically leading them. Supernaturally, food and water was just coming out of rocks. God was giving them provision. They had family. They had community. They had freedom. They had identity. Any single person that was logical could sit back and just see. Look at how good God has been. Look at how faithful he's been to them. But what happens is, is when you, instead of looking at this, you find the one thing that you don't have. We laugh about it. We're like, meat? Barbecue? This is what you're fixated on? 
And we laugh about it in church, but I know sitting in this room are a bunch of people where you have something that should be written on this box. There is something in your life that you've convinced yourself that you deserve. That you've convinced yourself that God should be providing for you and he's not. And the problem is, is what you will do when you're fixated on this, is you will stop seeing all that God has done. And you will again begin to go, ah, it's just freedom. Yeah, it's just family. It's just some food that falls from the sky. It's just water. I mean, rocks produce water all the time. It's really not that big of a deal. Yeah, we've been wandering the desert for 40 years, but our clothes haven't worn out. But that's just, just a coincidence. It's just, it is what it is. And all of a sudden we go, it's just a house. It's just a spouse. Just some kids. It's just a job. Instead of going, this life that I'm living in is a testament to how good my God has been to me. Friends, here's what I know. I know that some of you here are living in the very thing that you prayed for just a season ago. But if you're not careful, the enemy will blind you to it. And instead of seeing God's goodness, all you will focus on is what you don't have. And the danger is, is envy doesn't just stop at you fixating on what you don't have. Eventually, you will start to become bitter towards the people that have the thing that you don't have. And instead of walking around as people that walk in God's favor and blessing, we just walk around incredibly bitter. These are the simple ways that I think John 10.10 is fulfilled, where Jesus comes that you and I can have life and life abundantly, but the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy that life. Oftentimes it's simple things like comparison that will get you to rewrite your entire past. We have to know those days are coming. Circumstances are going to happen in our life that will force us to ask the question, God, are you still there? Here's what we do when we face those days. Here's how we prepare for those days. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, here's how you know. If you're sitting in a season today going, God, are you still with me? Here's what Paul's encouragement to us is in verse 32. Since he, God, did not spare even his own son but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? He says, you know what you do when you're convinced that this is what you need? God, where are you? Why is this not happening to me? And you are tempted to ask the question, God, can I still trust you? Are my best days still in front of me? Paul says, look to the cross. The cross is your and I's proof that our best days are still ahead of us because God sent his son to die. There was nothing that he wouldn't do to reach us, to ransom us. And the cross is our proof that this season, even though it feels like it is forever, it's temporary. You will get through this. Do not allow the enemy to begin to get you to romantically think differently about your past, to think about going back to the addiction that you've gotten out of. Because I'm telling you, when you allow the enemy to blind you to God's past goodness, you are just a few moments away from allowing him to steal all the blessing that are right in front of you. The second thing that I believe the enemy is going to try to do is blind you to God's present goodness. He will get you to miss everything that's right in front of you. You could be having all of the things you've ever wanted, you won't see it. Do you remember the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden was literally paradise. God took Adam and Eve and he set them in the garden. He walked with them. He lived with them. And he told them, you guys have the greatest job ever. Just go around and make a bunch of babies and name animals. Like, that sounds like a good job to me. Like, I can do that job. And and you can eat from any tree in this place. There's everything. I'm sure there was even a barbecue tree in the Garden of Eden. Like, go eat from it. But there's one tree you can't eat from. There's one tree that you have to avoid. And what happened? The enemy slowly whispered in their ear and said, yeah, I know you have all this, but what about this one thing you don't have? I think God's keeping something from you. That one tree must be the thing that unlocks all the real joy and makes, it'll make you like God. And the truth is, is you don't really need God. He's tricking you. And here's what that tells me. The Garden of Eden, Numbers chapter 11, it proves to me something that Tim Keller said years ago. Friends, this is the danger. Why envy is something we have to look out for is because envy will make you think something is wrong even in paradise. Do not fool yourself that the next promotion, the next house, the next car, the boat, the thing will finally be the moment where you settle in. You go, okay, great. Now I have arrived. Now I'm good. I promise you, it is a lie. There is never enough. There are not enough things in this world to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. It is something that can only be found in the person of Jesus. And what will happen is... 
the moment you allow the enemy to blind you to God's present goodness and you stop seeing it, what will begin to happen is you will be tempted to ask the question, can I trust God with my future? Do I really believe that God's plan for my life is better than my plan for my life? Do I really believe that if all I get in this life is what God has for me, that it'll be enough? Because I'm telling you, friends, what the enemy wants to do is he wants to blind you to God's future goodness as well. He wants you to try to get more out of this life than you were ever meant to get from it. See, the people in Numbers 11 forgot. They forgot that this story started with a promise at the end of it. Their story, their journey in the desert started with the promise that you will get to the other side of this. You are going to Canaan. There is a forever home for you. But what will happen is, is in the desert, in the wandering, in the busyness, you will get distracted and you will begin to look around and you will forget that this is temporary. This is all momentary. It is fleeting. It is passing. But there will be a day where you will be with me in the promised land. And friends, I'm telling you, it is not just them in Numbers 11 that are tempted to forget this as well. It's you and me. We forget that this whole life is essentially one wandering through the desert where what we've been given is a few decades here. We've been given a few decades on this side of heaven and we forget that this whole thing, this whole journey started with the promise at the end. We will spend forever with God in eternity for we will be with God in paradise. But when we forget it, we will try to get too much out of this life. And we'll begin to look around and grab things and try to make heaven on earth instead of looking for the day that we'll be in heaven with God. And while we're on this side of heaven, our prayer is, God, would you teach us the lessons that you have for us in this season? Make me into the image of Jesus. I know that there is a day where all of this will make sense. Every tear will be wiped away and I will be able to trace your hand. But until that day, I believe and I trust in you like that day is today. Friends, this is the hard part of this faith journey is there are even some things that we want that are good things. The desire to be out of your season of singleness, to be married and to have a family, it's a good desire to have. But if you're not careful, you will take even that good thing, you will make it a God thing and now it becomes a really bad thing. Do you know that Paul, he addressed how in your season of singleness that you want to get out of, here's how to have perspective in it. Here's how to trust God with your future. Even when you're sitting there going, God, I don't want to be single anymore. Paul actually addresses this in the church to Corinth. I want to share, it's kind of a bizarre verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. It's like, wait, no, no, he's, this is single people that want to be married, Paul, not people going to like the bachelor party in Vegas, right? It's like, what, the people that have wives live as if you do not. You're like, that's my life verse, okay, I'm moving on. Here's what he means though. Verse 31 says, for this world in its present form is passing away. Don't miss this. Do you know how you can continue to hold on when you're sitting there going, God, I want to be married so badly. Don't forget that marriage is something that, is only, that will only exist on this side of eternity. There is no marriage in heaven. What Paul is saying is that even the things of this world that we have elevated to God things, we will not need them in heaven. The consolation that was given for Adam to be married because it wasn't good for him to be alone, that, won't, that void will not exist in eternity. And so even the fabric of marriage won't exist. So hold on. Trust that you will get through this. And understand that there is a day that's coming that is beyond anything that we could ever imagine. Here's what Paul says. Last couple of verses for us and I'll get us out of here. Paul tells us about heaven in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, friends, remember that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you know how you can trust God with your future? How you can trust God in your present situation? how you can refuse to allow the enemy to rewrite God's past faithfulness to you is remember that we have a good father in heaven who says that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And when it's ready, he will come back for us. And it is a place that Paul says, even if I could begin to explain it to you, it would be like a four-sided triangle. It would be like a round square, like your brains couldn't compute how good it is. And so you don't have to fully understand it to trust and believe by faith that God is doing something good. Now, here's what I don't wanna do this morning 
is I'm not trying to paint with broad strokes and throw easy answers at what I know are really complex questions and situations. Because I know some of you are walking through some really hard things. But I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit, through truly seeing Jesus and the majesty of who he is, by feasting on the bread of life that is Jesus himself, we can do exactly what Paul said he was able to do. I leave you with this verse in Philippians chapter four. Here's the goal. Paul says in Philippians four, that not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. He says it a second time, I have learned the secret. He says he had to learn it. It wasn't natural. It wasn't his default reaction. He had to learn the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Verse 19 says, And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray. Father, I pray for a room right now full of people that find themselves in different phases of their journey, different seasons of life. Some of them have abundance. Some of them are wondering where their next meal is gonna come from. But Father, either way, I believe that you can develop inside of us a faith that is resolute, that knows that you are good, even when the circumstances of our life would tempt us to believe something other than that. Father, would we be people who learn what it means to trust you, to learn how to do what Solomon said, to be content with our lot in life, to understand that there's a life beyond the sun. And if we can live for that day, God, we can truly enjoy the life under the sun. So Father, I pray that you would speak to your people this morning. Holy Spirit, would you minister to the hearts of everybody that's here this morning? God, we believe that because of the cross, our best days are still in front of us, no matter what today looks like. We declare and decree that you are good and faithful. It is in the mighty and holy name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, thank you for letting me yell at you for a couple minutes. You guys are amazing. If you want to pray with somebody, our prayer room, our prayer people will be down here ready to pray with you. But other than that, have a great rest of your Sunday and we will see you guys next weekend.